Guys, if you have your Bibles, would you please open up your Bibles to John chapter 1. I'm going to be doing an atomic Bible study. I think that sometimes it's very important for us to just go through line upon line in Scripture. Now, I know that I have a lot of godly people that are a lot smarter than me uh, that would argue, no, you should do that every single time. No, you shouldn't do that every single time because sometimes, man, you need to preach the Bible in a practical application, which is topically, Right? Like, okay, how do we deal with stress? How do we deal with, we need to know what the word of God says concerning those things. How do we fight the sexual battles that everybody in our generation fights? How do we, how do we do, okay, we need to know the Bible topically, but there's a problem with knowing the Bible topically. And the problem with knowing the Bible topically is that it's kind of like going back at the back 40 acres and taking a shovel and you dig here and you dig here and you dig there and you miss whole parts of the field. Right? So I think it's very healthy to have a discipline in your life where you say, hey, I'm going to read all the way through. Hey, here's a great place to start. Leviticus. I'm just teasing. Do not start in Leviticus. <laughs> Do what I tell people in prisons all over the world and say this. Dude, just start with the book of John and just read the red letters. Get you a red letter Bible. Start in the book of John. Read the red letters. Find out what the words of King Jesus are. Start there. And then once you do that, go back and read the rest of the book of John. And go back and do that. I, I would suggest people get like a Thompson's Chain Study Bible. Uh, I love a Thompson's Chain Reference Bible. And like, why? Because I learned the Bible topically uh, because I didn't know any better when I first got saved. I was like, I wonder if the Bible has anything to say about doors. And I'd look up doors and I learned every scripture on doors. Like why? So that I could quote the door, so that I could quote the word of God when I walked through a door. And I was just a young man and I was like, ooh, I was a little bit more high strung than I am right now. This is the mild version of me. Mm hmm Hallelujah. You should have seen me. I'm something else. All you guys I went to school with, y'all just be quiet. Y'all don't say nothing. I know your stories too, by the way. So Starting off with the book of John, John is a very different kind of book. And John is, it, it has some different qualities than the other four gospels does. It's an amazing book. I have done an atomic Bible study on John chapter one once before. I preached for an hour and never got off of verse one. That's, that comes from my pastor, Jim Maxwell, by the way. That's what he does. He'll preach on one verse for, you know, 10 weeks. So what I would like to do tonight is I would like to go through this as much as I can. And what I'm hoping will happen is that the Holy Spirit will speak to you tonight. What I'm hoping is that your heart will be open and that you'll hear a word from the Lord where you'll go, that was a word for me because Jesus is speaking. And right now he's calling Pastor Gloria right over there. He's calling her. That's a godly woman, man. When, Pastor, when you got the hookup, she has it. Okay, so you guys ready to do this? Don't you, be, don't you be embarrassed, Pastor Gloria. It's okay. It's just us. It was Stuart. Dad gummit, Stuart. It's always Stuart. It's always Stuart. <laughs> Here we go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Four major points on this first verse that I want to give you is God is that John, John cuts straight to the point and says, Jesus is God. He doesn't get to it later. It's not going to be revealed later on. And he starts off, you know, with the whole, you know, bear a sheep thing, the whole in the beginning, right? Everybody say in the beginning, God. Well, he says here in the beginning was the word. And now he's going to introduce King Jesus as the word of God. I, I, I love how Jesus is presented in the other gospels, but he's like, look, whatever it is that you get about Jesus, this is what you need to know. He was God in the flesh. He wasn't God pretending to be a man or a man pretending to be God. He was God who literally became a man. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Furthermore, he is the word of God. And that was his actually name. And that was his name in heaven before it was revealed as Jesus was the word. <laughs> as it is in his true identity. It's his truest identity. The word is the expression of the heart of God. And he is the expression of the Father's heart towards all creation. So when the Father wanted to create something, the expression of that was the creator, who is King Jesus, as we will discover here in just a few minutes. He's, he actually is the one that creates everything with the word of God. 
So we know that Jesus has eternal communion with God. Um, Isaiah 7 verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. You guys know all that from the Christmas story. What's real is the very first promise of the Messiah, which is found in Genesis chapter 3, was that it would be of a different seed than the serpent. And this seed, would, this seed, this eternal seed of God Almighty himself would actually come through a physical woman. Well, he fulfilled that some 4,000 years later. 77 generations from Adam, Jesus Christ himself was born. And then verse two says, he was in the beginning with God. So what he's saying is this whole thing of Jesus being the word of God is not a recent event. This is something that has always been, it's just now made manifest to us. He was in the beginning with God. This is not something that happened 2,000 years ago. This was something that happened in a time realm that we cannot even calculate. And then we didn't come to realize that Jesus was the word of God or that the word was also God until Jesus showed up and he was the one who proclaimed it. Verse three, all things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. So did you know that when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, the woman at the well was talking to the person that created the water that was in the well. He is literally the creator side of God. Now, most people assume that the Father is the creator side of God, but he's not. If the Father desires for creation to be, Jesus is the one who creates it. Jesus, you know, I like to think of the Holy Spirit as being the creative side of God. And while the Holy Spirit is definitely creative, and I'm a Holy Ghost guy. Guys, are there any Holy Ghost men and women in here? Amen. You ain't going to make it without the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And men, you need to be doing your own study and be doing your own, your own uh, self-examination this year internally and saying, how much dunamis power do I actually walk in? Because the word dunamis is in the Bible 24, and this is the 24th year. But that's my conference, which is two Wednesdays from now. Amen. It's a big year for dunamis power. Now, but I, want to, I want to say this, that you have, to, you have to know Jesus and you have to know that he is the creator, which means this, if you personally know Jesus, there's nothing that he cannot create for you. There's no situation he cannot create that you will not prosper in. He can literally create a situation where you prosper. He can create a situation where you are healed. He can also do, sometimes God Almighty will do a creative miracle and actually heal you. And then sometimes God Almighty will do a creative miracle and create a situation for you to be in so that you can be healed. But in either way, it's Jesus who's being creative. I like that. You guys like that? Verse four, and in him was life and that life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Okay. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one right here. I passed up so much stuff already. My mind is going, please stop, and we've got to talk about this. But I want to get through a bunch of this scripture tonight. And this scripture right here is, I love this. Now, it's just good to know the language of this, you know. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not, as the old King James says it. Or in this case, the new King James says, did not comprehend it. Let me, let me tell you, uh, I, I think that the King James is a far superior um, translation than certainly most translations. But I also want to tell you this, that does not translate to modern language. You have to know the language better than most human beings. Most human beings living today understand the language in order to understand that. Can I tell you what that means? That means it was no competition. He shined into the darkness and the darkness was no competition. Now I want you to think about this for just a couple of times for, um, for just a second. The first, in the first verse, he starts off, he says, in the beginning there was a word and the word was with God. And by the way, the word was God. The second one was he was in the beginning. So he's God and he was also in the beginning. Then the third thing is, and it was the word that created all things. And then the fourth one, he says this, and when he showed up into the darkness, the darkness was no competition. And this is, how John, this is how Brother John sets us up for the understanding of who King Jesus is. And it's fascinating to me. It's fascinating to me. I've had the great privilege of talking with people who have never even heard the name of Jesus one time, one single time. And I'm all, you're always going to be a little bit perplexed. And you wouldn't believe how many Americans have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
We assume it is in the culture and that people will just get it by osmosis somehow, but it doesn't happen anymore. It's not a part of our culture. We live in a post-Christian America now, and if the gospel is not preached, and if we don't preach it, uh, uh, sorry, but nobody else but the church is going to preach that today. Leanna and I was, uh, where were we? We were someplace, we were in Mexico. It was when we were starting this latest, this latest children's home where we rescued a 14-year-old girl, a 16-year-old girl, and the day after, another 16-year-old girl that had been abducted at the age of 10, and she spent her first night in freedom with us on that Monday night. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Okay. We're in the elevator, and th- this, this dude in the elevator um, I don't know what nationality he was, but he spoke English very well, and he was an Asian brother. And he had on his arm, and it, it, it said, love others the way that you want to be loved. Right? Then he had on this other arm, he had a tattoo that said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And Jesus said, I'm sorry, I get Jesus and Leanna messed up sometimes. I've been conditioned that way through years of brutal abuse. So she, she, said, she says, oh, that's one of my favorite scriptures. And he said, what scripture? And she said, you're a tattoo. And he goes, that's a scripture? Brother has a tattoo that says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And he had no clue that those were the words of Jesus. That's a wow to me. That is a wow to me. When we were like, we were dumbfounded at it. We're like, wait, wait, well, what did, who did you think said that? He said, I just thought it was a cool saying. It resonated with me. And we're like, dude, check out Jesus. Because if you love his word and if it resonates with you, you need to find him in a really big way. You, you got his words tattooed to your arms. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, this no, I, this don't have anything. To, for me, this doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. I'm like, it doesn't matter for you. That is the word of God. And so he's trapped in an elevator with us and he can't get off. <laughs> That's a true story. I love elevators. I talk to everybody on, ele- on the elevator. It makes me mad if I talk to somebody and they don't talk back. Is there anybody else in here like that? Like you say hi to somebody, they don't say hi, they don't say hi back. I'm liable to hit the stop button on an elevator over that. You have no idea. But that was a long time ago. I'm not like that anymore. I know, we're gonna talk. I've already talked to you. I'm a human being, you're a human being. You can at least say hello. You can do that. All right, well, that was when I was young though and I was zealot back in those days. In, in, in verse six, in ver, so then in verse four he says, hey, you know, he's no competition. Verse five, the, the darkness is no competition. The darkness comprehends it not. It means it can't deal with it means it cannot deal with it whatsoever. Then verse six, he's gonna change. He's taking us through five verses. And so he wants to tell us all about who King Jesus is. So the first five verses, he wants us to know, let me tell you all about God and I'm about to give you a new name here within the next few minutes and his name's gonna be Jesus. But you need to understand that he is God who is the word of God. But I don't know if you can wrap your head around all that, so let me now, John changes and says, let me, let me help you wrap your head around a dude who had a divine mission. So now we're gonna change from Jesus to talking about John the Baptist. And then here within the next few minutes, he's gonna put it all together. So he could have started off, apparently John wanted to start off his story with, okay, there was this day when John the Baptist was out uh, baptizing people and Jesus showed up. And that was the day it all changed. But he's like, whoa, whoa, wait. I can't really start the story there because I might be reaching an audience that doesn't, doesn't know this other stuff. So this is the prelude to getting us to the baptism scene. Everybody with me? All right. So now he's going to talk about John the Whip. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Who am I talking about? John the Baptist. Got it. So verse 6. Now there was a man that was sent from God whose name was John. Now, since he's talking about the word of God, the next verse says, now this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light so that everybody might believe, but he was not the light, but was sent to bear witness to the light. So verse seven and eight, he says, now look, I know I'm talking about God, but now I'm talking about a dude and I'm not talking about the same person. Amen. By the way, can I just tell you something? You and I are not the light. We are sent to bear witness of the light. 
And we are the light of the world as long as we bear witness of Jesus. We are not the light of the world if we bear witness to anything else. We're just like the moon. Man, we're bright on a big shiny night, but we actually don't have any light on our own. We are reflecting the light. Verse 9. Now, he says, he was, verse 8 says, he was not the light, but was sent to bear witness to the light. And verse 9 says, and that light we're talking about, well, that was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. So when you start going through the language of this, you might just get frustrated and just go, man, why does anybody talk like this? Because it's a translation. It's a translation. And when you translate things, you have to either be literal or you have to be creative in how you, in, in how you actually translate it. And some translations are literal, trans or as, as literal as they can be. And then others are like, yeah, but it doesn't give the message. So somebody, and I've had somebody argue this to me before. I said, Troy, you told me to wear, you told me to read the book of John. I read through it and I can't even get past first chapter. I don't know who the heck it's talking about. Now, this is a common thing that happens among new believers. You will remember in the book of Acts, I think somewhere around chapter nine, uh, there was a guy by the name of Philip. God woke him up in the middle of the night and said, head to Gaza. And the brother is different than any of the rest of us because he gets up in the middle of the night and God doesn't tell him where. He doesn't tell him how to get there. He doesn't tell him what's going to happen there. He just says, you need to get there. And the brother gets up and he goes. When he goes and gets there, doesn't know where he's going, doesn't know what he's going to find, doesn't have any idea. He just knows that he heard God speak. And sometimes, friends, that's how it works. You don't have it figured out. You're not going to have board approval. You're not going to have your amen corner. You're not going to have all your family going, oh, it's so Jesus. They're going to be like, okay, well, give me some details. You're like, well, I really don't have any details. I just, I just really feel like I heard the voice of the Lord. And they're like, okay, okay, okay. And I want to tell you, no matter how many times you smoke dope and they didn't care, they'll care as soon as you start hearing God speak. <laughs> Suddenly they will get concerned in a big way, because that's scary, because see, there, it, it, it kind of brings this thought to mind, if you're responsible for hearing God speak, then I'm responsible for hearing God speak, and since I refuse to hear God speak, there's no way that you can be hearing God speak, so that ain't God. I've had a lot of interaction with those voices within my life. Like, well, if it was God, you would have had a better plan. If it was God, it would have turned out different. If it was God, it was this or it was that. What do you think Abraham told his daddy? Whenever he left Ur and left the priesthood and left everything that was in Ur, all he said was, I heard God tell me, he actually spoke to me and told me to get out and get into some other land. He said, first of all, which God spoke to you? I don't know. It's one I never heard before. You didn't, you didn't catch a name? No. You didn't catch a name? No. And where exactly are you going? West. West Where? Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay, sometimes this is all that you get. So whenever he got out there to Gaza, he comes across and there's this dude that had just come back from Jerusalem and he was part of the Ethiopian Messianics, right? He's about to be a Messianic. He's part of the people that were looking from Ethiopia, from the nation of Ethiopia. We're talking about African people who literally came up through this bloodline that had something to do with King Solomon. All right, and I'll just leave it at that. So they're literally a royal bloodline. So they are sent to worship there. They're Ethiopian Jews. Just like today, there are Ethiopian Jews that are living in the nation of Israel. And so you and I have an old folks home in Israel, in Ashkelon, for Ethiopian Jews. Right, and if you've ever seen the videos where Leanna was there a few months ago, right before October 7th, and all that kind of stuff. And it's real close to the Gaza border. And so there's lots of people, there's people that have been killed there recently and all kinds of stuff. But it is a safe haven and a bunch of bomb shelters. And those are for the Ethiopian Jews that are there. They're literally from Ethiopia. So there's this guy, he comes up and he's like, hey, uh, I've been sent up here. And the Bible says that this guy was in charge of all the money of this queen. So the brother's got money. And he was sent, and his job was to get the book of Isaiah. And so he goes into Jerusalem, and he buys the book of Isaiah. Now, you find somebody who's got one of the, you know, 66 Bible books, which, of course, at that time, he didn't have 66. 
And they're like, okay, I got one of the books. Well, you couldn't just go to the bookstore. You couldn't just download it. You had to have somebody that had an approved version that the scribes had put together. It's going to be on an animal skin canvas. And it's, if it's the book of Isaiah, it's going to be a big bunch of canvases with all these rolled up scrolls. Well, he gets on his chariot, so he's got an entourage. It's something like following a, a bank car, right? So, I, which by the way, do not follow Brinks. <laughs> Don't start following around. Because you'll find out real quick what happens. Like I found out when I was 15. I'm not going to talk about that. Amen. I didn't do anything. That's all I kept saying. It didn't matter. Like, why are you following us around? Just like, man, I want to see about a career in being one of you guys. Well, he walks up to this guy. This guy is a bad motor scooter. And he's in the chariot and he's trying to read the book of Isaiah. So you can't read because it's bumpy on a dadgum chariot. And so the fact that he's on a chariot tells me they're loaded for war. So they must have looked scary when Philip came walking up. You, whoa. And then he walks up and he's reading out of the book of Isaiah and he asks him this question. He says, do you know what you're reading? And he said, how can anybody understand this mess? I don't even know who he's talking about. He's, sometimes he's talking in, in past tense, sometimes present tense, sometimes future tense, sometimes first person, sometimes second person, sometimes third person. Is he talking about himself or talking about somebody else? And the brother's like, who in the world can read this? And the Bible says, beginning at that, at that scripture, he began to teach Jesus to him. And the brother got saved right there. And then he took the messianic heart into those Ethiopian Jewish people. And he did that. I said all that to say that it's common to go through the Bible whenever you first start reading the Bible and go, okay, I, I got trouble here and I don't really understand. Like in the first part of John, is he, talk, he says he's talking about God, then he's talking about some dude, but he says he's not talking about that dude. I don't get it. You can fight through that. There is so much written. Pull up, go to YouTube and start pulling up videos on people preaching on that and see if you get anything out of it. Talk to your pastors. Talk to your people. Men, form a community that respects the word of God and get into the word of God and get past the offense of, it's hard for me to get through these things. Wah is what I have to say to that. It's hard to be a grown man today. I mean, it's hard to be married. It's hard to have kids. It's hard to hang on to your money and you still manage to do all those things. Get into the word of God and say, you know what? I'm going to learn the word. Let's give Jesus a great big praise. Amen. This is on us, man. All right. <laughs> so he says, uh, I'm going to start verse 10. It says, and he was in the world and the world made, and the world was made through him. He emphasizes that about Jesus again. The world was made through him and the world did not know him. And he came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right or the power or the dunamis to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. So now he's, again, he's starting, he's trying to tell a story, but he's like me. He's having trouble because he starts going to different places. And he says, okay, I'm talking about John, but listen, he's not Jesus. And by the way, let me tell you about Jesus, man. He came into the world that he created and the world didn't recognize him. He came into his people that he made a covenant with and they didn't recognize him. So he's, now he's talking about Jesus again. You guys still here tonight. See, you got to learn how to make this a joy to go through this. You know, I have grandkids and I want to tell you, if they were somebody else's kids, they'd probably get on my nerves. But it's a joy to me. Because I love them. And like, I have a special relationship with them. And they do funny things. And you know, I was telling you guys, you know, I'm fasting. I was telling you guys that, you know, which, which I tell everybody, you know, man, you should fast at the beginning of the year and you should seek the Lord. You should. It's been a wonderful thing for me. And I, I, I want to hear God's voice. And I want to be desperate for him. And I want to be consecrated to him. You know, you're like, well, I think that's all the law. Well, it's not the law when you have a date night with your bride and say, here's the deal. I want us to get dressed up and go to someplace fancy and I'm going to talk to you, but I'm not going to talk to any, I'm not going to talk to you about anything except for us. Like, well, that's, that's the bondage of marriage. No, that's the joy of a romance. 
That's the joy of a romance. I mean, I literally have to set a timer on my phone to go off like every 30 seconds, or I should say every 30 minutes, to remind myself, don't talk about anything else other than you and her. When I hear the beep, I go, oh yeah, I've got to stay on track. Because it's not easy for boys to do that. Maybe it's easy for some boys in here, but it ain't easy for me. And go, no, I just want to be super intentional about getting dressed up. Let's me and you go out to your favorite place to eat. And let's just tell each other we love each other. And let's just talk about fun things. And we won't talk about anything else. Like, okay, well, so maybe there's somebody in here that thinks that that's ridiculous. And if you think that that's ridiculous, you don't understand the joy that Leanna and I have. And how that we intentionally go after it. It's exactly that way within the body of Jesus for people who fast and pray. The majority of the body of Jesus go, you know, that's kind of ridiculous to, to fast and to not eat and to go after God like that. Yeah, you don't get it. It's, it's not the law. It's the joy of romance, of going after the Lord and knowing if I seek him, I will find him. If I ask him, he will answer. And if I knock on the door, he will open the door to me. And I need some powerful doors open in the year 2024. And I've got some questions. If I ask, he will answer. I'm going to be preaching on Sunday about asking the right questions in the year 2024. And it's going to be powerful. It's something I've been studying for a long time, and I'm preaching it for the first time this coming Sunday. And using that as a catalyst for us to branch off into this new year to come. Because the Lord does want you to ask the right questions. It's so important to ask the right questions. But many times the reasons why we don't ever get off into the right questions is because we're so hung up on the wrong questions. How about, how about the why question? Why? 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 If you approach the Lord in the midst of an accusation, if he answers you, he's going to have to answer you in the judgment of that, of that accusation. So you know what he does? He just doesn't talk to you. I encourage you to learn the right questions. Jesus himself tells us how to ask questions. Do you know that? I was telling Pastor Gloria this before the church service. I was astounded to learn recently that from the beginning of Matthew to the end of John, Jesus asked 339 questions to people. He doesn't care if you just ask him, rattle off a whole bunch of questions. He wants you asking the right questions. Amen? So it says that he was born, talking about Jesus, verse 13, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but, but of God. Jesus is not man's idea. Jesus is God's idea. And if you look at Jesus, and if he tells you he will forgive you if you repent and just fall in love with him, if he tells you if you will lay it down and follow him and be discipled by him, you will inherit everything, I want to just tell you, no man came up with that. God came up with that and sent his only begotten son to deliver that message. Jesus did not come to deliver his message. He came to deliver the heart of the Father's message. If you want to know what the message of Jesus is, turn to the book of Revelation. The message of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the message of the Father towards humanity. Amen. It's the Father revealed through Jesus. The book of Revelation is Jesus being revealed. And friends, I want to just tell you this. He ain't coming back as a hippie. Everybody thinks he's going to come back and be the sweetest person in the whole world. <laughs> he's not coming back to be nice. He's tried nice for 6,000 years and hadn't worked very well. He's going to come back and be the Messiah that the Jews thought he was going to be the first time. It's, it's, it's a lot like Psalms 24, which we'll go over this Sunday, where it says, you know, who is the king of glory? The Lord, the Lord mighty in battle. Who is the king of glory? He's the one who defeats our enemies. Yeah, that's how Israel is going to recognize Jesus when he comes back the second time. They didn't recognize him the first time, but they will recognize him the second time. And all of Israel shall be saved. Amen? I love the word of God, man. I think it's so cool. Well, he wasn't born of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Okay, we can spend the rest of the day just being blown away at these words. The word became flesh. And we can spend a lot of time on that. But one should always contemplate to be filled with childlike wonder at the eternal making himself 
subject to all things that are not eternal. Like why? Because of you sitting right there in that chair, watching on television, listening on the radio right now. Because of this joker that's standing up here behind this pulpit. Because he wanted us. And he's like, I'm going to go get him. And I'm not going to go get them as God in heaven. I'm going to get them as God in humanity. It's remarkable to me. John chapter 14 goes on to say, in the 14th chapter, he says, look, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself that where I am, you may also be. So to live together in unity is always the desire of God the Father. It is his greatest desire, friends is that you be okay with him and him be okay with you and for, and for the two of you to be able to sit at the same table. And that's mind-blowing to me. We think in our own religious mentality that the reason why God Almighty has saved us is so that he can put us to work and uh, we can be awesome servants. I want to tell you, you will never do the service of an angel. He's got the greatest servants in the world. He created you to be his son. He created you to be his daughter. He created you to inherit things. He created you to sit at the same table and have a place at the table and say, this is my family. This is who I am. And for us to go, eh, I think I might have a better offer, not a good idea. It's his idea for you to be a part of his family. It was not your idea. You were clueless. You didn't know who God was. Those of us on this side of the world and those from us, those of us that are of all nations except for the Jewish nation itself, we went through thousands of years, literally millennia without any revelation of God. And we served demons and we called them gods and they enslaved us and they demanded the blood of our children and they did horrible things and we sacrificed horrible things to those little G gods. But Jesus always had an eye on us and he's like, I want them. I want them. Whenever you look at what happened to King Jesus and what King Jesus actually accomplished when he died and when he said it is finished and he stepped into hell itself. He didn't go to heaven, he went to hell. Like what was that all about? Why would Jesus go to hell? Because it's all about the eternal jailbreak. He's gonna go and he's gonna, he's gonna do some jailbreaking. Now there's a lot of theology in all this, but the bottom line is this, up until the time that the Messiah showed up, nobody could approach the Father. So there was a place where people waited who were in faith in covenant with God, but they had not yet seen the covenant fulfilled. Jesus describes it in his parable of Lazarus when he actually says, you know, there was a place that was in hell where they could actually see the torment of hell, but they were not tormented, but they're waiting. What are they waiting on? They're waiting for the roof to crack open and for the Messiah to show up and break them out of that jail and take them to the Father. Jesus himself shows up. He dies a sinless life as a human being. He says, Father, I commend your spirit into my hands. <sighs> and he takes his last breath and boom, he leaves. He doesn't go up. He goes straight down. He enters into the realm of hell and boom, he lands there and the demons say, ah, we got you. We've been trying to kill you for a while and we got you. And he says, you ain't got nothing. And a matter of fact, I'm going to preach to you now for three days and I'm going to tell you how the cow ate the cabbage. I'm going to preach to you the same exact way that Noah preached to the demons for 120 years. I said, let me tell you what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and it's right now. And I know that you devils are waiting on some kind of a jailbreak where you can get out once again and rebel against God. And indeed, God himself will take these keys that I'm about to take away from you and come down here during the tribulation, open up the pit and let you out to torment the earth for a while during the tribulation. But I want to tell you something, son, there ain't going to be no jailbreak for y'all, but there is going to be a jailbreak for them. Because on the third day, I'm going to rise up again. And until, until I do rise up, you're going to have to listen to my yapper for the next three days. And I'm going to show you how the plan was always right in front of you. And you were too stupid to see it. And here's what you really didn't see and you really didn't, you really didn't understand is this. Once I bust these jokers out of this hell jail and I take them to go see the Father, I'm going to stop and I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a short little bus stop in Jerusalem. I'm going to stop and talk to the ladies and tell them to go find the disciples. You all know the first people to ever preach the gospel that Jesus was risen was actually women. It was not men. So they go, and they go to go tell the disciples, uh, yeah, uh, the risen Lord, uh, he's like, hey, he's actually alive and all that. And they stopped, and by the way, the Bible says one obscure verse, one weirdo verse in the New Testament says, and many were raised from the dead, and they went and visited their family and walked around town. What's that all about? It's the bus stop on the way to heaven. 
And then he tells Mary, listen, I haven't, I haven't yet uh, seen the father. I got to go. I can't stay. Go tell the disciples. Go get them and tell them I want to meet them. And then boom, he takes off. He takes everybody with him. But here's the deal. And then he comes back immediately and he spends 40 days with the disciples before he ascends again. And then he actually says this crazy thing. This crazy thing. He says, it's better for you if I leave. How can it possibly be better for any of us if Jesus actually leaves? He says, because I'm going to send my spirit. See, God Almighty is God. Amen? God the Father is God. Jesus is God with us. The Holy Spirit is God in us. Amen. And he said, look, the same resurrection power that I resurrected, I was resurrected from the dead. I'm going to put in you, and you guys are going to be a bunch of bad motor scooters because I got a new job for you. Because this was the gospel he preached in hell, I believe, with all of my heart. He told those devils while they sit there and went, you got to be kidding me. He says, see, here's the deal. I'm not just going to break them out of jail and take them to heaven. I'm not going to do that. I am going to do that, but I am going to send my spirit to empower those who believe in me, and I'm sending them after all of y'all's nations. Amen. See, you just thought I was here for the Jews, but I'm actually here for everybody, Amen. and I'm sending them. And they're going to go out, and they were like, what? What? He goes, oh, yeah, I've always loved them. But my covenant nation is Israel, but I'm telling you, man, I love these people. And at the cross, I just removed all of my hostility, all of the Father's hostility towards humanity. And I'm going to tell them, I'm going to empower them, and I am going to raise them up, and then I'm going to tell them, go. And they're going to go to your nations. I can imagine some old demon sitting there with a the cowboy hat on. He says, I'm sending them to Texas, and you ain't going to have them anymore. I'm going to find them. They're like, they'll never serve you. Like, they will. They're going to find me. I'm going to find them. They're going to fall in love with me. And then get this. I'm coming back to get them. And they're going to meet me in the air. And then after we have our Holy Supper, I'm going to come back for Israel as a nation. And I'm wiping y'all out and I'm done. So that's the plan. Suck it up, buttercup. That's a brilliant plan. And Jesus revealed his plan to the entire eternal realm after he had paid the price. It was somehow hidden from them. And even though it was in the gospel, even like, well, the Jews didn't recognize him. Of course the Jews didn't recognize him. This was not revealed. It was revealed in little bits and pieces, little bitty tiny pieces and all this. And you can blame the Jews. Can I just tell you, the first Christians were Jews. They were not Texans. They were Jews. They were Jews, and it took a long time for any Texans to ever get saved. The first people with the program were the Jewish people, and we have this wild thing of, well, the Jews hated Jesus, therefore God just rejected them. We got this replacement theology thing that is demonic. It is a doctrine of devils. And what people don't understand when they fall into replacement theology is that the church has a different covenant than Israel does. Israel has to be saved just like human, any human being has to be saved. Can somebody say amen to that? When Jesus talked about hell, whenever he talked about the people that were in hell, they were all Jews. Because those Jews didn't know any Gentiles in hell. They didn't know any Gentiles. He was talking about Jews. Jews need Jesus just like anybody else. But God Almighty made an, a covenant with Abraham for the nation of Israel. And so when he comes back, he's not, when he comes back, puts his foot on the ground, he's not coming back for the church. He's coming back with the church. He's coming back for Israel, the nation. Amen. And I, I, I if you don't believe in Jesus, you're just crazy. When I mean, you say I'm crazy all you want, say, man, Troy, you've been studying the scriptures too much. Yeah, look at me. I'm such a 50 pound head. That's all I, I do. I'm so smart. You know, no, obviously I'm not smart obviously. So it's like, what is it? Man, I know Jesus. And when I see his word, man, my baby leaps and a fire inside of me. I, somehow I get it in my bones and I cannot shake it out. I'm like, wow, I'm on fire for King Jesus. Man, I want to encourage you guys fall in love with the Lord. Fall in love with Jesus with every single way that you can fall in love with King Jesus. Get into his word. Find out what the word of God says. Contemplate it. Study the word of God. Be somebody who's like, okay, if I'm going to learn all about business, if I'm going to learn all about marriage, if I'm going to learn all about finances, if I'm going to learn all about government, everybody thinks that they're a government expert now because of their Twitter feed. Amen. I, 
here's what I can tell you is this. You, you're not going to make it through life without wrapping your heart and then your head around King Jesus. I've heard it said many times, and probably I said it once or twice too, early in my preaching, that, okay, listen, it's got to make, you know, the, the 14 inch drop from your head to your heart. No, no, it's got to make the 14 inch lift. You get it in your heart and then you can form your mind to it. And there are things that I know in my heart and my spirit all the time that I never had words for it until I came, until I came across it in the word of God. So I close on this and just say this. Jesus is God. Jesus was with God in the very beginning. Jesus created all things. And Jesus Christ dwelt among us. And no, we did not receive him at first, but that did not keep him from receiving us. That's amazing to me, that the fact that we rejected him did not keep him from not rejecting us. The Bible says that at the cross of King Jesus that the entire world, everybody say the world, was reconciled unto the Father. That doesn't mean that they were saved. It means that all hostility that the Father had, every right that he had to just wipe out every single nation, he removed all that so that he could give every single nation that we are. No matter what nationality, no matter what race we are, no matter if we're poor, if we're rich, if we're country folk, if we're city folk. What's real is he gave us all access through the cross of King Jesus. Jesus did all that. And then Jesus went to hell and he told the demons what he just did. He says, you think you just murdered me. What I just did was give the entire world access to the Father. Let's give Jesus a great big praise. So good. All right. It's time for us to be done. Everybody stand up. I love the Word. I love the Word. I love the Word of God. Father, I pray, God, in the mighty name of King Jesus, sir, that your presence would be with us in this new year in a way, God, that our eyes are opened and our ears are opened. And God, no matter what we've walked in in years past, no matter what we've walked in, I pray, Father God, sir, that now in this time, God, that you would open up a door within our spirits. And I pray, Father God, sir, that you would give every single one of us a new heart to know you in a whole new way. I pray, God, for a new ear for this new year. I pray, God, for a new appreciation of your heart, God, that we would be like John and at the Last Supper put our ear upon the chest of King Jesus himself and say, I just want to hear your heartbeat. Father, I pray, pray, God, that our passion would grow. And I pray also, Lord God, sir, that the fear of the Lord would grow in us that we would be zealous in our love towards you, and that, Father God, sir, that we'd be so serious when it comes to, I, I, can't, I can't get off on some other path. I, I, I belong to King Jesus. My loyalty belongs to the Lord. Father, I pray, God, that you give every single one of us a grace for a full and verbal expression of recommitting our availability to you. Everybody just repeat after me. Say, King Jesus, Jesus. I'm available to you. I'm available to you. I pray, God, that every day, God, that we'd have a grace of opening up our mind and opening up our hearts, our spirit, our bodies, our flesh, our lives, our finances, our marriages, our work lives, all these things, God, that all of us deal with. I pray, God, that we'd be so available for you to step foot and breathe your breath of life and make manifest your Holy Spirit and bear the fruit of the Spirit in every single part of our lives, Lord. Father, I pray, God, for our families, that our families would know you in full demonstration of the Spirit and of power. I pray, Father God, sir, that our minds, however we have allowed our minds to be programmed, through all kinds of terrible things, God, that we let enter in through our eyes and the things, God, that we contemplate that is not you in any way. I pray, Father God, sir, that in spite of all that, God, that you would rewire our brains to think the word of God. 
Father God, I pray, God, that you would cause your Holy Spirit to resurrect our hearts and call our and cause our hearts to beat the love of God. I pray, God, for the works of our hands that all that we do, sir, that all that we do, all that we do would prosper and would glorify you and be something that becomes an asset for the kingdom. And Father, I love you, sir. I love you, God, and I praise you and I thank you, Lord, in this new year. Guys, so everybody's got their just their, their heads bowed, their eyes closed. Just keep this a holy moment. I don't want to dismiss here tonight on this first Wednesday of the new year without asking, is there anybody here just right there where you're at? You say, tonight, I need to receive the Lord Jesus. I want you just to raise your hand. Awesome. That's great. Hallelujah. I want to ask my brother and everybody that is here, I want you guys to say this prayer with me. Say, Father God, I need you, Jesus. Please forgive me. Please receive me. And fill me up with your Holy Ghost. And from this day forward, I belong to you and you belong to me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, let's give the Lord a great big praise. So good. So good. Well, the Lord is moving. It's a good year, guys. It's a good year. It's not an easy year, but it's a good year. I want to be unpacking prophetically the year to come at the New Beginnings Conference, which is not this coming Wednesday, but the next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, Leanna and I are going to get up here and preach together, and that's going to be next week. Guys, be seeking the Lord. Be consecrated to Him. Be happy. Be blessed. Until the next time I see you, I call you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, and highly a favor to the Lord. I love you guys. Good night, everybody.